So yeah, thanks very much for all of you for <coughs> joining this um, first workshop. I would say uh, I would say uh, I would call it uh, a sharing uh, sharing sessions. Uh, um, uh, so the objective is to propose this uh, light white introduction on the key genomic and data interrupt concept, which are key for the genomic for all. Um, uh, we I propose to open for questions at the end of each part. So there are five minutes questions uh, um, uh, question place. Please send your question on the chat, and I will uh, I will um, I will uh, propose the question after each each block. So the first one is uh, is Babita uh, with uh, genomic fundamentals. Then we will have uh, uh, Jenny Spara from David David Teams for uh, genomic analysis concept, and I will. Uh, finish uh, with uh, data standard and format and strategy related to fire phenopacate beacons and so on um, based on the time we, we have. Um, then I leave the floor to uh, to Babita. Babita. Babita it's on your side now. I stop sh sharing and I leave you uh, I leave you uh, sharing your, your desktop. Uh, thank you, Vincent. And hello to everyone. Thank you for being here on such short notice. Do you hear me properly? Because suddenly now there is a construction happening. It's perfect. Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. OK, great. <laughs> it's like some Murphy's Law or something that whatever go wrong goes can go wrong. So uh, yeah, thank you. Because it was something that we were discussing among ourselves that we should do something like that. And I'm glad that there are more participants now. And I mean, this can be a useful uh, information exchange, which I would also like from other teams to, to have for us. So something if something like this, we can continue. And um, I want to say, yes, the questions could be, uh, please write in the chat. But if you have something like quick doubts, please feel free to interrupt and think. Because uh, what we would like from this uh, workshop, uh, this kind of workshops, is to to create communication. Uh, you know, asking uh, basic questions, uh, clear, clearing up the fundamentals. Because we all are from different teams, and this is the strength of this this consortium, this project. So let's uh, let's uh, utilize that from each other. So please feel free to ping whenever you feel uh, you know something I, I left to say or, and I have to say that uh, this workshop. Um, I mean, I'm going way back, you know, from my in my school days and my college days. So I hope I do justice from uh, uh, what I'm presenting here because it has been long gone away from my memory. <laughs> so uh, welcome everyone. So my topic would be uh, giving you a bit flavor of genomics. What what is the what do we what is genes? What is DNA? What do we call what do we mean when we somebody saying genome sequencing or you know mapping and different file formats? So it's just to take away, you know, like a bit of flavor. I don't expect that you remember everything, but it's just that somewhere in your memory is like, okay, yes, that's I, I, I have a picture clear now. So I will start. Uh, I'm covering these three topics. Uh, let me start with uh, very basic. What is DNA? Where it is? What is gene? And what do we mean when we say mutations and why they are important? Uh, I will start with very uh, common variation that we see everywhere, which is skin color. You, you see that there are different gradients of the skin color. And uh, this is the word map that shows where the, you know, the sun rays fall maximum and minimum. And then you can see the variation kind of corresponds to where, uh, where the sun, you know, on our, on the earth, where the sun rays are higher and lower. And why is that? Because we have melanin, a protein, a pigment that is uh, uh, that uh, that codes for this, let's say, this color variation, the brown. Uh, you know, the role of this melanin protein is to protect us from UV rays. So it's obvious that wherever there is more uh, sun falling, we we need that uh, more more role of melanin, more active uh, active uh, melanin pigment. So so this is what uh, variation or mutation. Uh, I, well, I will exchange variation and mutation. Uh, please, uh, for for the sake of this uh, fundamental presentation, I will I will keep on exchanging them. So this is the variation that is somewhere coded in our DNA. Okay, so where is this? So I want you to take a look at your skin. So you have your skin. You have you know the first layer, the epidermis. You have your hairs uh, going out from your skin. And then if you zoom zoom in a bit you will see that uh, well you I mean, they, the skin is made of uh, these three uh, main layers the epidermis dermis and hypodermis and each of them have their you know different cells and you see this hair follicle the hair uh, 
go, going from from deep within and um, and you see different cells, right? So there is a different cell for epidermis, and there will be different cells for hypodermis. There will be a different cell, you know, these, you see the cell walls here, and then the blood flowing and the muscle cells. And so the, the tissues is made up of cells, you know, just cells, cells, cells. Now let's zoom into one cell. Uh, this is the this is the structure of one cell. They have mitochondria and you know every other apparatus that make keeps the cells functioning that provides energy to it. And we will zoom in now in the to the nucleus, the center, this part of the cell. And inside the nucleus, there is in each cell there is inside each nucleus there is like twenty three pairs of chromosome. The from one the pairs that that we see here comes one from our father, one from mother. And in humans, we have 23. In other organisms, you know, there are variations. There are around 300 to, to two or so. It depends what our organism you are studying. Uh, for humans, it is 23. 22 are autosomes and 23rd is the sex cells, we say, which is X and Y chromosome. And if you zoom uh, just one uh, chromosome, you will see that it's a, uh, it's a very basic representation of, you know, you extend that thread of chromosome and you'll see that it's made of this dna uh, strand the dna is the helical strand and uh, this helical strand uh, you know uh, we can say roughly that a segment of that strand would be a gene which will be composed of exon and introns you know so uh, introns will be something that we say is junk it is removed and the exons come together to form uh, mrna which then create protein. So in our case, that would be melanin pigment, right? So so then so this will be one gene, and then another strand will have another gene, you know, somewhere here, and then just sparsed around the around the DNA. Um, then from uh, if I uh, zoom in one one well one this strand one, uh, you will see that is composed of four bases. So DNA is uh, four bases A T G C and they they are in pairing so a always pairs with t a t and g always pairs with c and that is what we call as our basic code so in a way this four letters create all the code all the mes message all you know what what should be switched down what gene should stay active when when uh, which tissues uh, should uh, express which gene so all of this is just uh, by these four letters, A, T, G, C. And then uh, what we do uh, in bioinformatics would be then we sequence this. So this strand of DNA, this to get these letters, you know, we want to, and, and you know, uh, well, just notice that if you're getting just this one strand letter, you can always predict the, what, is the, what is the second strand, you know? So you would just need this one information of one strand. Then you can say, okay, this is G, so you can say, okay, the opposite strand would be C. So, so this is what sequencer does. This is the data that we get. And now from here, the bioinformatics part start once we have these uh, information of this strand. So this is what we get as a, as a bioinformatician would be nothing more, just these uh, sequences, sequences, sequences. And uh, I want you to take a closer look. Do you, do you see any patterns here? Do you see something happening or it's just uh, random letters of ATG, ATGC? Well, if you notice, there will be, you will see some certain letters are dark, certain letters are capital, certain letters are small. What, what, what it is trying to do here is to, uh, to divide them into different categories. So for example, introns, exons, then there are mutations, variation, there is stop code on. So each of, uh, so it's not that they are random letters. There is a, there is a pattern, there is a signal, uh, there, there are, you know, um, certain, certain information that we need to, that, that we need to extract. And, uh, and yeah. So exon, intron, I, what I said before, the introns are removed, the exons come together, they create mRNA, and the final, this mRNA, the transcript, then it creates protein. Protein, everything what we see is protein, our hair is a protein, our nails are protein, everything, the, the body, everything that is functioning is functioning in the form of protein, you know, certain enzymes, certain, so, so, what what is the final product is protein but what it comes from is where it comes from is the code that is in our dna now uh, i want to talk a bit about mutation so mutation would be like uh, very simply if one of these bases gets converted into something else so i see a here 
and then maybe it can convert to T or G or it, may, it might be deleted. So what happens when something interrupts this code, this, this, uh, this code that is uh, integrated in DNA? Uh, well, it changes meaning. Uh, there's a very funny representation of different type of mutations that exist and, you know, how it changes meaning. So if our normal uh, letter or word is beast, there is a mutation called substitution, which is more like the B will be converted to F. So the meaning changes, right? Then there is insertion. Another letter will be inserted here. It becomes breast. Then there is a mutation type, which is deletion. So you remove one letter and then it becomes best and inversion, which is like swapping of the S and T to T, S, T and S. So these are the different mutation type that exist that can change the coding information. And uh, then this is the basically the at the letter level, right? And then the same kind of mutation can happen at the chromosome level. So certain the entire chromosome can be a, a certain segment can be deleted or inserted or duplicated or inverted. So there are different type of mutation that exist at chromosome level also or at DNA level. And another one would be translocation. So a seg entire segment is cut off and, and it's joined in another chromosome. So just to, uh, well, just to make you think a bit. So if, if I say that this A at 1700th position is converted to T, what kind of uh, mutation that would be? Uh, well, it will be substitution because uh, you see that a just one letter has been changed and how we will represent it we will represent it because i say this is a sequence of chromosome one right and then this is 1700 position so i will say that at chromosome one at 1700 position a is converted to t and this is a mutation type substitution okay there are different ways to represent but this one be, would be very common way to see that uh, what we are talking about so each the position matters which position we are talking about and of course, the chromosome, which chromosome this mutation has been found, and uh, type of mutation, etc. Now, I would I would like to uh, well throw some emphasis why it is important to study mutations. What role do they play? So, our uh, favorite fruit fly is the model organism for biology to test your experiments and to see to have. I mean, so much of understanding about genes has been and mutations has been. Uh, come from these uh, tiny, uh, you know, um, organisms. So what scientists used to do before, you know, it's like, okay, you switch off certain positions and see what effect it is causing. So this is one experiment where uh, there are genes that that decides uh, which part in the embryo of your fly, which part will become fly, uh, sorry, wings, which part will become legs, which part will become, you know, antenna. And there is a control gene that controls, well, kind of each of these uh, genes separately. So what happens if somebody inserts mutation at the control gene itself? So that's what that there was an experiment done, and you see the normal fly, this 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 eyes, there are you know its leg and antenna, and then when the mutation was inserted in this control gene instead of the antenna, there were legs uh, that started developing. So this is how you know we understood that what each you know mutations at just different places what they are doing. Uh, mutations in human diseases, I mean, uh, they, we are studying sickle cell anemia, sickle cell disease in our project. And the sickle cell is basically uh, that uh, instead of red blood cell, you see the circular shape. What happens is the red blood cell shape is converted into this uh, sharp, edgy shape, uh, sickle cell. It's called sickle shape. And what happens is the blood is not able to flow smoothly. You see that there is, a, there is a, it's, uh, it's stuck. And it causes pains. It causes, uh, you know, several uh, complications because the red blood cell is not able to carry oxygen, plus also to flow, flow smoothly in the blood, blood veins. And this has happened just because of one mutation. So you see, it's normal DNA mutation. Uh, DNA is GAG, and the A is converted to T. And this mutation, just this one variation, causes the protein to instead of having this normal round-shaped hemoglobin, to be to have this clumped hemoglobin shape. Uh, likewise for cancer, you know, it's uh, there are several ways that our cells can be damaged, and you see there are the radiation or virus or different chemicals or pollution, and what it starts with, you know, that one uh, one mutation, one variation in the cell, and then you know the cells are replicating and they are accumulating these mutations, and you see from from uh, from it, it starts uh, forming a mass, and then this starts uh, you know uh, progressing and and. Uh, in invading other tissue type and which we call at the final stage, this is the metastasis stage of the cancer. 
uh, mu uh, mutation and aging. So it, uh, there has been several studies done on the aging and how mutations are uh, well involved directly. And uh, this is one example of uh, of a kid. Uh, there's a disease called Werner syndrome, which is uh, it creates uh, aging. It, the aging start developing faster. So this is a picture of a ten year old girl, which has it shows like fifty year old. Is because the aging has uh, started, uh, uh, you know, having faster. It shows all the she shows all the signs of uh, aging, like heart disease and uh, you know hair loss and all of this and this is due to uh, mutations in in this gene that uh, that causes this i uh, um, just to uh, well broadly the mutation has been classified into somatic or germline mutations uh, germline mutation will be uh, you know that the cell starts with just one cell so the entire organism starts with just one cell one sperm cell and one egg cell so if there is a mutation that has been inserted or it, it is uh, it, it has been you know hereditary it has been uh, inside in the sperm cell or egg cell what will happen that the entire organism will carry entire cell of that organism will carry that mutation you know and then uh, this person when they will reproduce half of their gametes will carry that mutation however there so that will be germline mutation that it will be we, we can call it more hereditary style of mutation so for example our eye color variation our hair color would be would be these kind of germline mutation because this is uh, every part of our cell have this variation in our dna then the second part then the second type is somatic mutations which will be that the mutation was inserted later in in some phase of life so so the organism the, instead of carrying it in every cell in every part of your dna it will be just a, some small tissue or small patches that will have that that mutation and uh, this will this kind type of mutations does not you do not uh, uh, transfer it to your offspring and uh, this uh, an example could be that for example smoking if uh, if somebody is a smoker and they show the sign of a tumor that will come under somatic mutation category because that would have been destroyed you know certain tissue like lungs let's say uh, and then that created this tumor and uh, it went to different parts of the body so that that will be uh, somatic mutations these two there are different pipelines to to call the variants to study these two uh, these two type of uh, mutations and that's why one has to be aware what they want to study and what kind of uh, variant calling they are going to perform when they are studying the dna sequences now so wrapping up the first part so we we, uh, we uh, knew a little bit about what is gene uh, what uh, what is the gene sequence and then what is the different type of mutations that exist on these sequences the second part is uh, genome sequencing so i said that you know you extract the dna material from the cell and then you send it to the sequencer so what is the magic that sequencer is doing and what is the type of sequencing that exists uh, just like some interesting facts that a human body has around 100 trillion of cells and each inside each cell there is a nucleus and in, inside each nucleus there will be like 3 billion base pairs of around 30,000 genes uh, on a DNA so so that's why here the type of what kind of sequencing you want to choose and what how much you want to burden yourself with the data comes here so you have to be you have to know what you want to study and uh, Basically, there are three different type of se uh, sequencing. Well, sorry, just before that to take a look. The before, uh, so far, we I was talking just very simple about genes, introns, and exons, but it's not so. In, uh, there are a lot of other regulatory elements that exist. I said the introns are cut out, but even if they are, uh, they are, they are called junk DNA. There are certain regulatory regions that exist on these sequences. So that's why it, it makes it uh, important sometimes to study not just the meaningful regions, what we can call exon, but also to see the entire strand of 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 the DNA. You know, to see it around what is happening, why this gene is switched off and the others are not. Uh, if uh, you know, is there something happening at the uh, cis regulatory region or you know the transcription sites the you know far away enhancer site so that's why it, uh, it becomes important sometime when you are studying or creating your experiment to know what what you want to uh, what you want to be sequenced to what you want to see in your data so uh, being said that so then that's why the there is a first type of genome sequencing is whole genome sequencing where basically you are sequencing the entire dna inside a cell 
So everything from point, to, you know, start to end, telomere to telomere, you will be sequencing that. Uh, this is, uh, of course, this is uh, heavy uh, financially, and as well as, you know, you are bombarded with data set. Uh, you cannot go much, you know, uh, sequencing depth would be like uh, around 40 max to, uh, you know, it's more like to study the, the horizontal, um, like the entire thing than to, than, than to be precise and study the vertical, um, well, <laughs> I'm forgetting words. So, so then that is whole genome sequencing. Then second part will be uh, no whole exome sequencing. Exome will be remember that I said exons are the meaningful part. That is the one that create mRNA transcript. So then you will you just pick the the one or two percent of the DNA that codes for exons, exons, and then you are only sequencing that to to see where is the you know mutation lies that is that is going to affect protein directly. So instead of looking into the regulatory regions, you want to just look precisely, want to go, okay, this is my site and I want to know in exons because they are the one translated to protein, what is going wrong there. So that, that considerably, you know, um, uh, you see that around only around, instead of 100%, only around 2% of the genome will be sequenced here. And you can go for farther depth, sequencing depth. So you can go for 50 to 100 X. So depth will be how many times you can repeat the same uh, sequencing experiment so you get a more clear idea, you know, if you are calling the basis. It's very cost effective. And the third part, even further cost effective would be to go for uh, targeted sequencing. So you know somehow that this is the region of my uh, of the genome that is corresponds to this disease. So I only want to go precisely to that, you know, 10,000 uh, letters or base pairs or whatever, and then you sequence that. So you see that you don't have to go for entire genomic region. You can uh, pick point. I want to know what is the sequence, what are the mutations exactly in that region, and then you can do the targeted sequencing. Uh, I quickly wanted to mention about GVAS studies as well, because this has come a lot in the discussion. So GVAS is uh, nothing. It's just basically screening people to know uh, variations, uh, what is the variation for certain phenotypes. Let's, let's say I these patients, the green ones have sickle cell disease. So what you will do, you have no information where the mutation lies, what is the variant, uh, what are the variants in these people. What you will do, you will sequence, you know, these uh, people with uh, sickle cell disease versus control, and then you will call uh, the differences. So what these common, these what are the variants that are common in these green people compared to the compared to these uh, control cases? And then you can, for example, this is one representation that you see. Okay, this is the variant that st sticks out for for sickle cell disease patients. Uh, likewise, FIVAS would be all almost going the other way around. So you know that this is my variant. I know now. I want to screen people for the what is the phenotype that it shows. So this if show me all people all patients that have this variant and then what you want to study is okay, okay these va uh, this variation leads to i don't know all of them showed high blood pressure and you know skin cancer and gout disease so you will say that okay the these phenotypes are connected because they all have this this variant so that will be fever study well just just very quickly uh, then so to wrap up second part, of course, uh, there are different types of genome sequencing. It all depends on what you want to study. And um, yeah. And then the third part would be very quickly. I don't know how much time I'm taking. Uh, third part would be different genomic format. So the, we sequenced our DNA, we got our sequence. What do we do now? What is the, what is the follow up steps? Uh, there are very uh, basic uh, pipeline flow that from from the beginning of the data. So you wet lab that you collect the samples, you you extract you know the uh, tissue, the DNA, and then you do the library preparation. You send it to sequence and machine. From there, from the sequencing, basically we divide the analysis uh, of these into three parts: primary analysis, secondary, and tertiary analysis. Um, I will just very quickly uh, go through these. Uh, remember, David, the next, uh, uh, sorry, Janice will be talking about this in detail. So very quickly from the sequencer, the raw data that we get, we, we, we get it from the FASTQ for, uh, in the FASTQ format. Uh, then we map them. It creates the SAM or BAM format. And then we call the variant calling. Variant calling will be to know what is the difference compared to the normal, compared to the reference, you know, what, would, what was the difference that uh, in our patient. So that would be the variant that we are calling 
And uh, so the fastq files, you know, this is a set of reads that the sequencer will throw at you. They look like this. So it is the file format that we receive this data. So that is the, so you see that there are sequences, you know, what were the sequences? and uh, and some quality of the sequences you see there are quality scores what you don't get is is they are just random reads you know you don't know where they are from where they are coming from the sequencer is just throwing you the reads now what you have to do is to go take those files and then map it, it back to the reference genome reference genome in that case will be uh, you know uh, human genome what is the normal human genome looks like compared to that you want to see what in what is the variation in our files right so so you have to map them uh, per you know each fragment where do they where they are mapping on the reference genome so you see this is the mapping done here uh, there are tools that do this mapping and uh, and then you know uh, so once you map these you know the position where each fragment has mapped you know which chromosome they have been mapped. And then this is the file, which we call a sequence alignment file, SAM file, and the binary of it is called BAM files. So this is the SAM or BAM files that we get, which tells us the position. You see the chromosome, it's, it says, uh, the, tells the position and the fragment of, of the DNA that has been mapped. So this is very important step, the alignment. Without this, you know, you cannot uh, go further because we need to know where these each of these fragments has come from. And then once you have these alignment files, what you want to know is what, where is the variation, right? So compared to the reference or the normal genome, where, where is the variation showing? Is like if I sequence three patients, do all of them carry the variation or just a few of them carry certain variation? This is what you do with the calling the variants uh, to know what was the difference. And this, what we basically, it's the VCF file uh, variant calling format. It's the file that we, we end up with, where it shows the position. You see the chromosome of the, there are the headers. So the format is that there will be certain headers to give you information uh, about, you know, keywords. And then the file starts with the chromosome position, ID of the variant, etc. So you see at chromosome 20 at position this, you see in the reference genome, there was G, but in the alternate, there was A you know and then you can get information for different patients what was the frequency of these allele frequency of this variant so this is basically i would say would be that uh, like a magic file from there on you can do several things you can annotate you can you can know where these variants are falling you can compare among patients you can do all your you know cool machine learning tricks to st or, or you know separate the data into different uh, categories whatever so that will become that will come under tertiary analysis what you want to do with this file and I would say that mine would be still here. So to wrap up uh, final, finally, what, what we learned today <laughs> is that what is DNA, what is the variation or mutations, what is the DNA sequencing, what, what do we mean when we say, you know, what the sequencer does, what kind of bases or the, or the files that we get from the sequencer, what is mapping, what, how will we call, uh, how do we call these mapping, uh, going back to reference genome and calling out single variants. And then the next part would be that is covered in, in the next talk will be tertiary analysis, what you can do with this VCF files. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And um, please uh, contact me if you have more questions or you have proposals for, for the next workshop. And uh, please ask questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, <coughs> Bavita. It's uh, it's impressively simple uh, for a so complex domain. It's uh, that's very very good. Uh, so looking at the the different question, I didn't browse them because I didn't want to uh, disturb the the recording. But uh, um, the first one is uh, which is the reference genome based on which a mutation is identified. Sorry, which is the reference genome? Uh, uh, which is the referent genome based on which a mutation is identified? Which publication? Uh, the reference genome, I think they are yes. interested by the reference genome that you use for mapping and for mapping yeah. your, 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 so, your, your reads. So there are consortiums that basically they create reference genome for, let's say, for human, you know. So what is the, what should be, what is the normal human genome looks like? Um, 
which has, so you know, we use at G19, at G18, they are GRC at 37, 38. So they are different reference genome that has been proposed by the consortium to be used. And they have studied each of these positions, you know, like I don't know how many sequencing depth, and they have finally concluded that at this position, uh, considering all the variation, you know, A is that, A is the most common um, base there, something like that. So we have these reference genome. So it's um, you can pick one like at these 19, my is my favorite. Or you know there there are websites where you can download these and then you can basically run your tools against this reference. You know, if I'm answering this question correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're answering it. Yeah, and and there's another question which is related to that. It's um, how this reference genome um, has has been defined at the beginning because uh, it's difficult to identify the a perfect human exactly. genome. Exactly. So, how did they do that at the beginning? Uh, you know, it's all the time. It's uh, it's changing. There's an entire you know a, a team of uh, dedicated people working on this, and then we, that's why there are different version of uh, reference genome. So we what we try to do is to take that latest version. You know, at, uh, what I'm so saying about at G17, at G16. Now the version is at G19. So it's always it's constantly you know they, we get more data. The patches are filled. However, the common one usually it's it's uh, it has not been so much changed than the than but what what i'm trying to say here is that you take the latest one that has been proposed by the community this reference genome community and then then you start working with that because it's true that it's very tricky to know what is the original reference genome because you know there are variations variations everywhere okay great and there's now a question related to a mutation and uh, so the first one is uh, is the last one on the chat is uh, the the SNP acronym. So could could you uh, explain briefly what SNP means? I think you you went through it quite quickly, but uh, yeah 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 that. that's true. So SNP is single nucleotide polymorphism. You know single yes. because this uh, SNP is what substitution I would say is that single nucleotide is is changed. You know, and single nucleotide polymorphism would be like eye color. Is there will be just one variant here so instead of a this will be t and and that will have blue eye color if it is g it will have you know green eye color i'm just a you know it's not it's not literally like that but figuratively speaking so single nucleotide polymorphism is that just the sequence will have the same it's just what variation it contains just at one position it it can it can give you this different variation phenotypically that's what it's the substitution mutation or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism. Great, that's perfect. And the last one related to these mutations uh, is uh, how the mutation are caused. I mean, what what are the the, the roots? Um, the, oh the my God! Thank you for asking this question. I had that in my slide and I removed it at the last moment. I thought I will. It will be too much for. So let me just. It's in the. It's somewhere in the end of the slide. Yeah. Sing, uh, how the mutations are caused. Uh, there are different, so there are external causes of mutation and internal causes of mutation. External would be, you know, uh, radiation, chemicals, what we are eating, what we are smoking, the, uh, you know, there are certain viruses that insert themselves in our DNA, uh, you know, they change the basis directly. So there are several external causes of mutation and then there are internal causes of mutations as well. For example, uh, adaptations in different, you see this insect looks like leaf how this adaptation, it comes inside this insect, you know, because the, it, it started very, uh, certain variations started happening. And then what happened is that this kind of insect started, uh, you know, uh, not being dead. So they, they de replicated in the population. So that is what natural selection is, right? So internal causes of mutations could, could make us adapt to a certain environment where we are living in and the external causes of mutation, you know, different uh, things that exist um, in the environment that is, uh, that is, we are because we are interacting all the time with nature you know outside we are all the time our body is interacting with it so uh, mutations are happening all the time it's just we are lucky that we have such long uh, genomic sequence you know that even if they are falling randomly most of them just get discarded they don't and there are dna repair mechanism in our dna so it repairs all the time if there are random mutations falling you know so we are very lucky that there are these systems in place that doesn't actually, you know, it doesn't uh, affect us so much, even if these mutations are randomly falling here and there. 
Okay, thanks very much, Babita. You are perfectly in time. I'm really impressed. <laughs> so, <laughs> really, thank you. No, no, it's impressive. You are exactly in time. Uh, so that's perfect. Oh, that's so, great. That's great. Okay, so um, thanks a lot because it was a. It is a very complex domain presented so simply. It's um, really um, uh, showing a, a deep expertise on the domain. Thanks very much. Um, You're welcome. Uh, yes. So now perhaps we. We can switch to the second topic. I think uh, let's hand over to um, to uh, Jenny Spara uh, for his presentation. Hello. Uh, I, I leave you the floor again. You have your own presentation that you can share. Okay. So to share it's this open share tray, no, I guess. Yeah. Uh, can everybody see the presentation? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay, and you can hear me well. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, so it's a twenty minutes presentation plus uh, five ten minutes questions. Okay, I will try to do my best. Do it. Okay, uh, it was a very nice uh, presentation from Bavit about all these uh, DNA topic. It's a very complex thing, as you might have seen. Uh, you get a lot of new concepts. So we're going to go a little bit through some of the things that she explained about the file format, but I think it's good because she didn't have a lot of time to explain these things. And but basically we're going to go from the sequencing to the variant. OK, like uh, I'm going to be very brief because with 20 minutes, there's not a lot of time. Let's see how well I can do it. OK, uh, so basically these are the main steps that we will see that uh, in some parts we'll see that the, we are going to break down in even smaller steps. But basically when we have uh, a sample from a patient, we cannot sequence the DNA right away from the cells. We have to do like a step that it's a library preparation that it's done in the lab that I'm not going to go into that, but it means like we break the DNA into small pieces and then we prepare them for the sequencing. We had to add different things to be able to read these these fragments in the in the machine in the sequencer machines okay so basically we have like uh can you see the pointer no we have uh a, the whole genome that it's in this in these threads that that she's playing that are the chromosomes and basically we break them into pieces okay and when we do whole genome uh, we break them into small pieces because we cannot sequence the whole uh the whole the whole chromosome, there's some restrictions of the size. We can just sequencing uh, bits of uh, with Illumina sequencing that it's the technology that it's mostly used nowadays. It's around 120 base pairs or 200 depending on the machine. OK, but we have to thread the genome in small pieces to be able to fit them into into these machines. OK, so when we want to sequence the whole genome that Babita also mentioned, uh, we take the whole genome and we break it into the pieces and all these pieces we put them into the machine and then we will see what's the result. She also explained that sometimes we can just sequence fraction of the genome that is the exome like the parts that code for the proteins as she was mentioning too. If we want to sequence the exome there's another step that it's uh, there are different kind of capturing steps where we capture only the regions that we want to sequence the regions that we want to that correspond to the exome. So we have like uh, uh, baits that match the sequences that we want uh, to, to sequence based on the reference genome that we have and then we capture only the parts that correspond to this and then we sequence them uh, and then we send them to the machine only the ones the fractions that we want. Uh, Babito was mentioning that this is more cost effective but uh, actually, nowadays it's kind of changing a little bit because sequencing it's more expensive. Uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and capturing it's keeping the same price. It, it's also going down, but it's still uh, not cheap to to capture. So uh, nowadays, actually, most people it's it's if there's enough money, and they prefer to ho to go for the whole genome. That although it's a little bit more. Uh, expensive you get all the information as we mentioned all the regulatory regions that are not in the exome so this is uh, something that it's kind of changing just for you to let you know but so far nowadays most of the things that we are sequencing are still exomes but it's it's kind of changing a little bit okay so i'm not going to go too much into detail because i don't have a lot of time but basically we have these fragments from dna then we have to adapt some things that they do in the lab in to be able to like attach them into a surface in the in the sequencing machine and then we clone them and basically well, we 
repeat them. And basically at the end of the day, what we're going to have is like thousands of thousands of dots in one of uh, these uh, microscopic uh, surface that this is what we're going to go for the what we're going to use for the sequencing. And again, without going too much into detail, if this is a string of DNA and one of these each of these balls correspond to one of these nucleotides that she mentioned, ACGT. Basically what we have, it's a chemical uh, reaction that it binds like the complementary base. Uh, uh, David also explained that for each uh, base, there's a complementary base that A's and T's, C's and G's. And every time that we join one of these nucleotides, we produce like a, a signal, okay, we have a laser that produces a signal with a different color and then we clean and then we keep adding like the complementary basis for all these uh, original sequence that we want to, to get and the different light colors will tell us which is the base that, that we're having, okay. And we do this not for one molecule but for this uh, set of molecules that are clones or are all the same and we're going to have like a, a, a bit of light with different light for each uh, step of the sequencing, okay, for each cycle, what it's called. Okay, so basically what we will have is for each cycle, we will have an image like this with uh, thousands of dots with different colors and each dot could correspond to one of these random fragments from the genome. Okay, and then we can identify, okay, in the first cycle it was green, it's a G, in the second cycle it was blue, it's a T, A, and we have to do this, there's all this software that these sequencing machines have, that uh, uh, it's able to, to do this, okay. So when the machines do all these cycles and get all this information, the final output from the machines, it's these fast Q files that Babita also mentioned, where we got like an identifier that it tells us, okay, uh, it gives us a name to this particular uh, sequence. And we also, in most of the machines, we can trace this name to the place to the physical place into this into this uh, surface and then it tells us which are all the letters that uh, we sequence no that we every time that we put a base that we saw which which was the complementary and as she mentioned we also have like a code that says which is the quality of each of each base what it's what, why it's important to have the quality for each base because these machines are not perfect and the reactive can go wrong, the DNA can be also kind of damaged and we want to know how certain we are that this base corresponds to the real one. Because as far as the end product that we want to know its variation in the human genome, if we add vari technical variation, if we do a mistake here, we will think that this could be like a, a, a mutation but it, it would be just a technical effect. So that's why in all the steps that we're going to do from now we have a lot of scoring systems to know how reliable are the bases that we're sequencing because this is a this is a challenge okay it's not so easy to get like this sequence from uh, a person that we just press a button and we get like 100% real what is going to be there. There are many steps that can fail and then can cause issues okay. So for instance this would be like uh, the representation of the scores of of the average scores for a read that for all the reads that we sequence in in a regular sample okay and we'll see that there's a there's a scale that it goes over 40 it was uh, till 40 and from 30 to 40 it's considered that it's okay that it's blue from 26 to 20 it's okay it, something happened there and if it's lower then it's that something wrong no that the the, the color was not captured properly or that there was a mixture. It could be many things that can happen here. So what we want when we do a sequencing, it's to be sure that we are on these scores. Also at the beginning of the reactions, the machine is not working so well. I don't know now the technical issues, but usually the, the score is a little bit lower and then it reaches a plateau and then it goes down. And that's why we cannot sequence longer than 200 base pairs. Okay. We want to know that because sometimes things go wrong and we have like images like this where we can see that the scores are all over the place that something went wrong. It could be that reactives were um, out of date like they were mm, bad or the machine was not well calibrated so we need to know how well th this first step is because of course it's crucial. It's crucial. We need to know that uh, we're getting uh, the right thing. So that would be like the sequencing part so that we will get these fast queue files where we have like the sequence and the quality score for each uh, for each value 
And then, as David also mentioned, the next step is to know these sequences where they belong into the genome of reference. She mentioned that there's a reference genome, that it's like a standard of the human. We also have like uh, databases where there's all the variations that we already collect, but we're not going to go into that. We have a reference genome and uh, we mapped. Okay, one thing that I didn't mention is that nowadays usually the um, sequencing is done by um, uh, pair red n, pair red n, so that it means that we sequence from uh, from a fragment of the genome, we sequence like 100 base pairs usually, or around 100 base pairs from the beginning and the end of the same sequence, and then we have like two anchors that we can map these into the genome. Okay, we don't sequence like the 400 base pairs, it's just like a technicality. Okay, we just sequence the beginning and the end of the read, and then we can map this into the genome. Okay, and we have thousands of well, millions of, of these reads that uh, that we want to put into the into the genome. Okay, what can go wrong in this step? Okay, as I mentioned before in the sequencing, there are things that can go wrong. What's the things that can go wrong here? So there's technical issues. It could be contamination because when we get the sample, maybe we got mixed with uh, something or like a piece of our skin fell there and we are sequencing also part of our genome. So there could be uh, like uh, contamination uh, from other species also. Sometimes it's less things, but we can have things that won't be mapped into the genome genome because correspond to another. Other kind of technical issues, it's that the whole genome, as Babita mentioned, uh, the human genome is not completely sequence already, like not all the regions of the human genome, because there are regions like the telomeres and the centromeres that are really difficult to sequence, and there are still gaps. So that's why she mentioned that there are like uh, new releases of the human genome. They are not very often, they happen like every few years, but there are some regions that still are are not sequenced. We have like 90 something percent of the whole, of the human genome, but not all. So there can be reads that correspond to these regions that we don't know and and then then won't be mapped there's another part that they are like the human genome have a lot of duplicated like as regions that are very similar okay that during the evolution happen to be like replicated and they're with uh, these short uh, reads they can be mapped in multiple places in the genome so that can be a problem also because if it's not exactly the same place we also can see like mutations that can happen there so that, uh, that's why also we will have a score for each read that we map into the genome, okay? And we discard the places where there are too many variations or that there are multiple places that can map into the genome or things like that, okay? So this is another place where we filter for possible uh, things that can happen in this step. At the end of the day, for instance, what we would have when all the reads are aligned, this correspond to an exome sequencing where we only sequencing these blue boxes that are the exome. We will have reads pile up into the regions that we wanted to capture. Okay, if this would be whole genome, we will have like a more or less a steady line that will cross and every all the regions of the genome will be covered. Okay, but in this particular case, we can see also that the parts that are uh, captured have a higher coverage and then the coverage decreases uh, outside of the regions that we were capturing. Okay, this is, yeah. So, and all this information, as Babita was mentioning, is stored in a BAM file. Okay, and BAM file, basically what it has, is also the name of the read, and there's many information that I'm not going to go too much into, into, into it now, but the basically is that it gives us which position of the genome this read has been found, which is the score that the maximum usually it's 60 if I'm not wrong, and then it tells us if there are insertions, deletions, if how well it mapped. But it also keeps the quality scores from the fast queue because we will also like to know at some point when we go further we will want to come back to the okay but this particular A was a good call or no was not a good call. So it has to keep all the information that belong to the FASTA file. Okay so that's why these files are even bigger than the FASTA than the fast queue files. Okay so now we would be in this step of the mapping and after the mapping after we have the sequence uh, the, all the reads that we got from the sequencing into the reference genome we know where they are we can start to look okay which are the positions that are different from the reference and that are the same from the reference okay as babita mentioned we have only one reference genome but we know that each of us each individual we have two copies 
of, of, of this reference genome, one that comes from our mother and one that comes from our father. Okay, and these are the possible combinations that we can have. We can have like the two bases that are the same from the reference and that are the same that are in our parents, or one may be different from our father and the, the, the one from the mother is the same, or the two can be different, okay, uh, or one in the other strand or in the other chromosome, no, that is the other way around. Maybe from my mother it's a G and from my father it's a C, okay. But when we sequence, as we mentioned before, we cut randomly all the fragments of the genome and we cut all the chromosomes, so we don't know which reads come from one or the other. So, uh, from all these variant positions that we have, that is around 1% of the, of the whole genome, we have like, as she mentioned, 3 billion uh, or 3 million, uh, 3,000 million. Um, we want to know which are these positions that are different. But what we got when we sequence, it's this alignment. Okay, these are uh, down here, we have like all the reads that we sequence for this particular region in this example, okay? And what can happen, it's, it's a thing, no? That we don't know which ones correspond to one or the other. In this case, I put it in red to be to visualize it easily. But basically what we have is positions where we have the same in all the reads that to the reference that are, these are usually not interesting because it's the same that it's in the reference. And then we have positions when half of the reads come from the chromosome from the mother and the other half from the father or the other way around. So technically we will have like if we sample randomly correctly all the reads that we cut from the from the genome, we will have 50% with C's and 50% of G's. Okay, or in this case T's and C's. And the ones that are, if we have for the two chromosomes all the different, we have like a complete set of uh, alternative alleles that we call that are different from the reference. Okay, so usually what we call it's reference, what corresponds to the reference, an alternative allele if it's different from what it is in the reference genome. And technically we will have 50 and 50, but sometimes we also see things that are not 50 per 50. We see some things that are less, like are like 20% or just one read that it's different. What can happen here? As I mentioned, it can happen that it's contamination. It can happen that it's some uh, sequencing problems. So these are usually the things that make it uh, difficult to predict the variance. So it's not so straightforward. And that's why we have a lot of programs that are specific that compute uh, statistics to be able to sure to distinguish the things that are real, that the things that maybe are real, but it's just a problem of the sampling or maybe are not real and are just like sequencing errors or uh, sample errors or uh, mapping errors because this can be caused also for a mapping error. Okay, apart from that, uh, uh, I just want to mention also that Babita was talking about germline and somatic mutations. The problem with the somatic mutations is that sometimes all the sample that we had doesn't have the somatic variation. Okay, as she mentioned, it's like a we have like patches, no? Sometimes if it's a somatic because it's not in all our cells. So when we take a sample, it could be that it's mixed. So we can have like not 50 and 50% that it's what we would expect if it's, or like 100% if it's like what we have in all the cells. If it's just a fraction, it's like a subset that will be different. So this, uh, this 50 or 100% could be reduced because only a fraction of the cells will have this variation, okay? Maybe this is a concept that it's a little bit difficult to understand now, but the, it, this is what makes somatic prediction sometimes more difficult. Here it's just like a, 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 a summary, no? In this particular case, germline variants are the ones that are in all our cells and that if it's a disease that it's caused by a germline variant, we will see in our family, okay? That most likely, if it's not a new, that it just happened in one individual, we will see that our father also had the same disease or our sister, okay? And uh, this also can happen with cancer if it's an hereditary cancer, okay? And these are what we call like the Mendelian diseases that we can have all these family trees and we can say, okay, this person was ill and was married to this person and then that we know how well should distribute this, this disease. In somatic barriers, usually it's what David also mentioned, it happens just in a set of cells, for instance, in the tumor, we have like a specific mutations there. And we, they only will occur there, but sometimes the tumor is mixed with, with regular cells, so it makes it more difficult to know exactly what's going on there. And uh, it's the thing, if it's just a small fraction of the cells, when we, we will have like uh, 
a small fraction that only has this variation. And that's why sometimes what we want to do in these particular cases when we are looking for, uh, for somatic mutations is to have a control to know which are uh, a control that we suppose that doesn't have any of these somatic variations. For instance, if it's a cancer in, in our lungs, so just a, a sample of the lung and then a sample from another tissue that usually it's blood because it's the easiest, and then we can compare the two tissues and then we can see what's, what's particular in this lung tumor, okay? Then, uh, as she mentioned once, uh, all these uh, come from different steps. For the first step was the, the, the mapping, and now when we have like uh, the reads mapped, we can do the, the, the final step that it's uh, get the variants that it's the, the BCF format, okay? And in the BCF format, she also mentioned that, that we have like, what's the reference uh, allele or what's the reference base and what's the alternative and which position. And then we can have information of, okay, uh, for one sample or for different samples, like, okay, how good it is. Usually they have a score also that it's based on the quality of the, uh, of the co of the sequencing, the quality of the mapping, they max, they mix all this information and they tell us, okay, how reliable it's this base, okay? And usually it's one line for, per change, okay? This is some information that can be there, like as I mentioned, like also we can want to know, okay, did we have a lot of sequence in this particular area or was the dif area difficult to sequence? So there's many information that we need to know. Then when we have this, I'm still kind of on time, well, a little bit late, sorry. Then we have, uh, we want to add information about uh, about these variants that we just predicted and which kind of information, well, these are the numbers that we get through. We get around 3 million variants. If we look just at the exonic regions, we reduce and it's only like 30,000. And uh, she was mentioned the SNPs, the single nucleotide variants or simple nucleo polymorphism, but there's also the inders that are the small insertions and deletions and the copy number variants. There are uh, some different things that we can find. And just uh, for the annotation, it's the information that we can add to this variant. And as uh, I kind of mentioned before, there could be quality metrics of how well it's the scoring for the sequencing, for the mapping. But after this initial part, we want to know also the biological context of this variant. Okay, is this variant corresponds to one of these uh, coding regions? It corresponds to an exonic, it's a regulatory region, which gene it is? And then if it's uh, a change in an amino acid, it's an important change. So it's uh, something that it's gonna break the protein or it's something that it's just, we don't expect any change to happen. And then we want to add the information in the from the population. It is a variant that we find in most of the population because if it's the case, most likely it's not a disease or it's a rare variant that only happens in a small fraction. That could mean that it's, it's related to a disease, okay? And we have databases, external databases that have all this information that it tells us for each base of the genome, which, which gene they correspond, which region correspond. And also we have base databases that tells us, okay, when we switch an amino acid or a base, which is the impact that we're gonna have. And we have databases that tell us, okay, all the frequencies of the variants in all this human sequences that all the human sequence data that we have so far. And when we have this information, then we want to filter, no? And we want to filter, of course, we want to know the ones that are, uh, if there has been some problem with the, um, uh, with the sequence and we want to discard this, if we don't have enough coverage for this base, we can to discard. Then if we are focused on a particular set of genes because we are studying a disease, maybe we will we'll just grab, we will just uh, get the information that correspond to these, uh, to these genes. And as I mentioned before, if the, if it's very popular in the, if it's very frequent in the population, it's not interesting. We're looking for things that are in lower frequency when we are looking for diseases, okay? So just to summary a little bit, we use this next generation sequencing techniques to obtain genetic data from the patient. The technology is not perfect, so errors may happen. And as I tried to mention, in different steps, we can have like different errors. So that's why, um, uh, we want to keep all the information from the different steps to be able to trace back if this can be a potential error at some point. 
The other thing is that we don't understand completely the genetic basis of human diseases. That's why we don't have, when we have a base, we cannot say, okay, it's clear that this is going to be the disease. We have to annotate and say, okay, from which genes, and then after some uh, studies, we can say, okay, this is a candidate, we should check it. Maybe in 20 years, we will know everything or what all the bases of the human genome do, and then it would be like more straightforward. But so far, there's a lot of, uh, of work to be done when we know which are the variants that are in a patient. And as far as uh, these two things, we need to do these filterings to avoid technological errors or to avoid bases that are not uh, related with diseases. Okay, and this is the last part that, that we need to take into account. And well, this is from the Senac group in the bioinformatics unit, and I hope uh, you understand. There was a lot of concepts. Uh, just ask anything, and you can ask me later if, if it's needed. No questions. Questions are already there for you. <laughs> don't 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 exit. Okay. Um, the 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 first one from uh, from Inaki is. Um, is uh, is related to the the rare disease and our topic in genomic for all. So uh, <clears throat> he's asking uh, if uh, when we identify a genetic a genetic difference in a in comparison to a reference genome, can we uh, identify already at this stage a rare disease? Everything is what I mentioned in this last slide. It's not trivial. Okay, we have the reference genome. It's a general genome that represents us, all of us. But of course, all of us have difference. We are not all the same. So we have the reference genome, but we also have a databases that tell us all the variation that we've seen in the human genome that contains thousands of thousands of millions of of, uh, of variations that we have reported so far. And the more the sequence, the more variants that we find. OK, variants can be what she mentioned, no? like the hair color. Every of us have different hair color. So we have like different variants or height, like things that are depending on multifactorial things. So when we find a, a change, we need to go through all these annotation and filterings to be able to see if it can be related to a disease. OK, if it's in a protein that it's related with the disease, if it's truncating this protein. Uh, so it's so far it's a it's not a pressing a button and getting a result. OK, uh, <clears throat> there is another one related, I think, to the annotations mm -hmm. and um, um, in fact, the question is uh, related to the to the database that are available to mm -hmm. uh, to to annotate uh, the, your 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 variants uh, in the in the process. So, could you? So, is there a sort of database table based on which you do this association? I mean, there's a there's a m multitude of database, but could you explain a little bit how that is done? Are the database maintained by public authorities and the software and the open source tools to do that? Uh, querying that, wh wh how is that done? Uh, so yeah, there are uh, many public databases that usually, uh, as being public, are open like are open to use for everybody. Uh, the problem is that usually they are like uh, in different groups, so there's some. Uh, uh, centers that they are annotating the genome in the sense of like oh, where are all the genes and where are all the exons. This is also not trivial. We still don't know where are all human genes and there's still debate of which are the canonic uh, bases. The, the, so the canonic form of all the of all the genes, but there's a standard annotation that most of the people follows that it's the ensemble. There's also the there are also different groups that do their own. But this is one part, and there's another part, for instance, that takes care of what I was mentioning, the variation in the in the population that re that has like the information of all the variants that we found in in the human genomes. And basically, what we do, for instance, in our center, is to put all this inter all this information from the different sources together, so the user can uh, be easily access to all this information. But so far, there's not a one public place. And for instance, there's also the OMIM, that it's a database of, of diseases, of human diseases, where there's a catalog of all the bases that are known to cause disease and description of the phenotype of the disease. But again, this is another database. So the problem now is that all the information is kind of scattered and you have to put them all together. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there are two other questions, but one one is to me not very clear. But uh, I, I ask it perhaps uh, uh, Balas Subramanian. Perhaps you can clarify a bit. But uh, okay. the question is, what is done if there is a variant, for instance, for instance, in a specific genes whose effect is not yet identified? Um, okay. 
Yeah, that's, that's a problem. As I mentioned, we don't know still all the genes and we don't know what all the genes do, the ones that we know, okay? That we know that roughly there are around 30,000 genes, but for some of them, we actually don't know what they do in the human genome. So you can find a variation there, but as far as you don't know what this gene do, it's very difficult to uh, to prove that this could be the causing of the disease. Usually we have like, uh, we work with the genes that we know what they do, and but many, that's why many diseases cannot be diagnosed so far because sometimes we don't find any mutation in the genes that we know and it could be that are in genes that that we don't know what they are doing and then you cannot prove so there has to be like a lab that it decide to the okay this although we don't know what this gene does it has these domains that seems that are related to these so we are going to try to find out what this gene does and try to prove if this is the variation but this is very cost and it takes a lot of time to do something like this so basically people just look for the genes that we know what they are doing Okay, and and, and the last question: <clears throat> um, What is the state of the current uh, single cell technology with respect to variant coding? For example, can you do a single cell uh, genome sequencing for improving variant codes in the case of somatic mutations? Actually, there's uh, some technology going into this field. I'm not an expert in single cell. We have a group here that really it's working into that. Uh, I know there's some work done on that. I think there are some limitations also because, of course, when you have one single cell, it's very difficult to have like the whole genome because, as I mentioned, you cannot sequence from the beginning of the end. You have to cut into pieces and some of these pieces can get lost. So it's not trivial to get like all the information from one single cell, but uh, there's we're getting there. There's some improvements, but I cannot go deeper into this so far. If you want, we can ask uh, the people that it's expert on this in our group and, and give another talk about that. Okay. Um, I have just a short question related to um, uh, <clears throat> perhaps a, a, an order of magnitude of the, the size of the file that we are manipulating here. I yeah. know it's really depending on what we are doing and uh, if it's a wood genomes or if it's just an, a, yeah, yeah. A, a gene sequencing and so on, but could you give some ideas? Yeah, I was meaning, I was thinking of doing a table with that, but I didn't have time with uh, all the information. But yeah, usually like an exome, as Vita said, it's around uh, usually 90x. That means that you have 90 reads covering one particular position of the exome. And usually the first queue is around 10 gigabytes of information. And then the one file, it's usually kind of double, like 20 gigabytes of information. And then the BCF file, uh, usually you reduce because you only have the positions that are variant. And then you get a, a relatively small, like around 180 megabases. If you add a lot of information with this annotation, that all usually all these uh, the information from the genes, all these frequencies, you can add them into the BCF file, and then you can have, have like all the information for each particular variant. It can go around 100 megabases or something like this for exomes, and usually for genomes, it's uh, around 10 times bigger for the fast queues. It's around 120 gigabases or 250 for like the BAM files, 200 gigas. And then the BAM files are, uh, the BCF files are around 400 megabases or something like that. If you're interested, I I, I could make a table with uh, with all this information, the number of reads that we usually have for certain coverage, because I think I will do it for myself, so I can, I can send it to the group with uh, a little bit more detailed information about these uh, sizes. Okay. Uh, and the last question related to the, the pipeline um, that are running these different transformations. Uh, how in, um, in, um, in, your, in your institute uh, are you uh, running, developing this pipeline? Are you using standards or are you doing your own uh, um, using your own tools for developing that or? For the pipeline, actually uh, we had like an internal tool for developing the pipelines, but we are trying to move to, to one of the most standard pipelines. Um, but we are still uh, looking at which is the better option. This thing of the pipelines, it's also something that, uh, uh, yeah, many centers are struggling with to find which is the best way, because if you have a, like a, a computing cluster machine, you want like a pipeline that it's compatible with this, and there are many, there are the common word for language, the, the, there are many others, no? Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we are still exploring this field. I don't know if Davide maybe can add something because maybe he's more into this, because I'm not too much into the developing part of the of the team. No, 
when we, when we talk about the workflow manager, I, I think at Sinaga uh, we, yeah, we are using this internal tool developer, which is called uh, Jeep. But and now we were uh, trying to move to use it to make Jeep compatible with uh, WDL. WDL. We can import the WDL uh, pipeline and run it in our cluster. Okay. No, because in the project, as we are expecting, we are expected to aggregate data coming from uh, different uh, um, research center. Uh, the, 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 the this uh, pipeline definition may becomes a key a key aspect to consider in order to have the same level of uh, VCF data quality and uh, and um, and content um, at the end for feeding the AI model systems. But Okay, thanks a lot for <coughs> for this presentation. <coughs> I don't see any other question, uh, so perhaps it's time for me to switch on my topic. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks again for your presentation. You are perfectly in time. I am really impressed by everybody. So I'm I'm, I'm going to try to do the same <coughs> and be at your level. Um, uh, it was very interesting and very very self explanatory. So um, the we have 15 minutes left, so I can. <clears throat> so the, the the last part is related to uh, data formats and um, and uh, and standard, which is uh, so an important aspect that to consider in this in this project in order to align everybody. So, um, uh, to 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 cover and present this um, data standard space, I'm I'm using this diagram, which is. Um, that I've inherited from some other documents, and uh, which is presenting a, a very simple, simple precision mating uh, journey, bit and pro position the different actors of, of this journey. So you have uh, you have the, the the patient, of course, which is providing uh, uh, at a time a sample, um, and you have um, the the center part, uh, which is related to the data processing, so the sequencing, alignment, and interpretation. Exactly what uh, what has been presenting the in the past sessions but out of that uh, we have a connection with uh, what we call the, the diagnostic report systems which are interpreting above the vcf file and the annotation which are connecting this output to the clinical context of the patient and the clinical knowledge and the knowledge store is very important and which is feeding then the clinical space so the, the clinician the experts which are then um, providing uh, some uh, treatment to the patient or recommendation in parallel to that we have the research space which are interfacing with the alignment interpretation uh, pipelines for analyzing based on a large amount of data archives, uh, so bio, uh, biobanks mainly uh, most of the time, but also the knowledge stores storing all of the information on the on the internet related to a specific domain. Then the, the, these these information are feeding back the diagnostic report uh, pipeline, uh, diagnostic report task. So when we overlay, uh, which are the systems which are running that? We have uh, mainly three type of system. We have the EHR, which is the place for the clinicians, of course, which is storing all the clinical information and the the, the patient records, and which is containing mainly clinical data and very, at the moment, very limited uh, genomic data, very, very limited for the moment. Um, we have all the interpretation, uh, alignment, sequencing, which is done by, I've called that a, a genomic limbs. We should be a little bit more precise here. The genomic limbs is uh, usually the entity in two hospitals, which is doing that for for, for, for uh, on demand based on the clinician request. But uh, we also have, and that's the case of the Seneca Center, we have also this capability into the research center. Okay. And then we have the Genomic Research Center, uh, which are handling the data archive, the research and so on. And if we all, of, all overlay that with uh, data formats and data standard, it's where we see uh, what has been explained today, FASTQ, BAM, SAM, VCF file with annotations, which are feeding the diagnostic report. That's the first group. Um, then once uh, we have the diagnostic, we enter the EHR, well, the standard, I would say, is, is HL7 at the moment because HL7 is fire 
is the, 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 the well-known data format for interfacing and operating with uh, EHR and clinical systems, but we may have proprietary systems, of course, and it's most of the time the, the case with the PDF files which are you know, containing the diagnostic report and the, all the mutation. Um, but we have a, a bunch of other standards and uh, it's a simplified view, but I've just tried to position the one that are of interest in our project with beacons and phenopacket here used in the research field. Uh, we have external database for the knowledge store like the PubMed, Elsevier, and we, of course, the data archive are also storing the VCF, the FASTQ and the BAM SAM files. OK, so. And yes, of course, between the clinician and the patient, we st we have continued to have other data format. Fire may be used for collecting consent of the patient. Fire is now embedded by Apple into their Apple Watch, so it's a standard for also collecting, starting collecting patients, um, uh, patient not outcomes, but at least uh, vital signals and so on. Um, so that that that's the so what is um, uh, uh, so, if I go now to uh, use cases, we have started doing, in order to work on the data standard and format, uh, we have to um, explore which use case this uh, big project is uh, asking us to, uh, to, to tackle. So, at the moment, uh, we have just explored, I would say, the centralized models where data are stored into a, a central place, the genomic for all platform, and uh, where we have uh, researchers, clinicians, or genomic for all um, AI teams which are accessing this data. Uh, there are other, of course, use cases that are not covered here today. It's uh, and to to unmature, but related to the federated learning, uh, which is uh, at the heart of this project. But if we look at, at the centralized models, uh, I've just presented here two key use cases, and thanks of course again to the work package three. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, Francesco, and that's uh, mainly a formalization of what uh, what, it, what it, it told me and showed me during these uh, very interesting meetings uh, with the different uh, um, sub, sub disease group. So in the research use case, what do we have? We have two type of um, analysis, what is called retrospective data and, and, uh, and uh, prospective data collection. With retrospective data, we, um, we, we do a kind of bulk data upload uh, into the platforms, going through an anonymi anonymization process, of course, uh, um, in order to preserve the, the patient and, uh, and, and be in line with the, the patient consent. So that's uh, something that is, uh, is managed currently by the different research institute working in the project. But the bulk data upload push uh, an amount of data into the platform, and this data are of different type. We have genotype data, we have clinical data, um, and then the, the framework and the AI model catalog is developed currently by, is going to be developed by the AI team, so that's the first interaction, but we may have also another uh, entity, so the research uh, entity, which may be interested by all of this data and contracting with uh, the future platform for accessing this data through different type of services, exploration services, cohort design, and then analysis. So with a specific uh, AI framework that could be offered with a variant analysis and so on, and potentially publishing information based on that. So there's a whole space of services that can be exposed to this research community based on contract that uh, the, the, the consortium may, may, uh, may um, may create with the, with the research uh, external research system. And uh, the prospective data collection is something which is going through a kind of a simplified clinical trial and uh, <clears throat> where the clinician discuss with the patient, follow a, a, a study protocol, uh, use the care facilities for making some uh, exam, uh, pathology lab like pathology or genomic laboratory. So that's where we have uh, the genomic sequencing that we have discussed today uh, deeply. We may have imaging that are stored usually into the EHR or, or, or annotated or, or documented into the EHR. And we may have per patient, individual patient data upload. That's what we call prospective data collections during a, a clinical study. Okay. And on the right hand side, well, I've just listed 
the, the two use cases that we are looking about. And why do we do that? It's mainly to analyze which data format we need at which steps. It's a basic approach, a use case, data flow, and then data standards. Uh, the second one, which is clinical use case with a, with a centralized approach, is um, is uh, something that is uh, in in, in uh, where, where the clinician, in fact, rely on the platform to get some decision support uh, decision support. So it's a query which is pushing clinical and genomic data, and in returns, the platform and the AI model is suggesting a risk score or up to a, a prescription suggestions. The clinician remains always the, the owner of the final decision. Um, <clears throat> so we have different type of data. That's a first preliminary release based on uh, uh, the MDS data set that uh, the MDS teams uh, um, subgroup has already shared with us. And thanks a lot for, for this uh, huge amount of information that was uh, that was provided there and from the, the other work group. So we have different type of data, which are of different category, clinical data. Here I show the different standard candidates we have, FIRE, phenopacket, blah, blah, blah. And we have omics data that we have discussed today. We have imaging data, DICOM, MINK, uh, we have candidates for this format, and the demographic data, uh, sex, age, populations, where it is, and so on, and FIRE and phenopacket are there, uh, potentially for, for covering this, um, the, this domain. Uh, so you see arriving in the middle here these different standards, and that's uh, uh, and standard data, data format. So uh, why do we need that? We need we need an alignment on the standard because because we have several uh, sources of information, several hospitals, and and these different hospitals have uh, their own EHR system, which have their own data model. So if we don't align in the genomic for all project uh, on a canonical model approach strategy, uh, it's it, it's going to be a nightmare into the central platform to uh, to provide the different services that are expected. So there is a real challenge to identify the set of standards that we need um, and uh, then ask uh, uh, all the, par uh, the, the partner of this project to, uh, to, uh, to comply or make the, the maximum to align with this, uh, with this strategy. So if I go to these three standards, there are three slides here, I go very quick, but the first one is FIRE. Uh, fire is uh, is uh, is something which is uh, in the in the continuity of the HL7, which is the the, the, the big consource, the big uh, standard body for clinical data. So um, the, the, the 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 fire is a, is a data model. It's a server technology, but it's also an API. And um, the the adoptions started with HL7 v3. And uh, when we look at fire, in fact, it's made of um, a data model, uh, which is cut into what we call resources, and that uh, uh, resource is finally a, a table, and we have reference between these different tables. But it's also an API, so it's also a search API that allow uh, kind of um, uh, introspection, data introspection into the, the, the data set, the FIRE data set. But FIRE is not covering the full spectrum of clinical data, because if we look at, for example, the life science market, we have other alternatives like OMOP, which are um, which are much more uh, adopted by the the, the the research and the life science community. And if we look at genomic, it's not yet at the level of um, of, of 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 the research uh, um, the, the expected. It's not yet sorry at the expected level of the the research community. And there's nothing neither for not so much for the, the payer market. The second one is uh, is this Feno packet, and this is a, a GF4GH project, and um, the. The, the reason of the development of Phenopacket, which is quite recent, you see it's a V1 in 2018, is that in fact uh, the doctor uh, and the, the researcher which are working on, on rare disease uh, have, um, have to centralize and formalize the phenotype of a, of a patient. And there's a bunch of phenotype uh, described in various sources of information, publication, database, EHR systems, and so on. And there is no finally a, a very, very well documented standard for representing this phenotype. And that's exactly what we we, we have to tackle with uh, with genomic for all and rare disease. So that's where Phenopacket is arriving and providing a, a kind of simp simple data formats for, for representing 
uh, phenotypes, but the advantage is it is linking the genotypes data also and allows a representation of, of geno genotypes information in it. Uh, but PhenoPacket is not an API, it's a, it's a data format. The big advantage is that it's supported by what is called Protobuf, which is a, a standard uh, developed by Google, which allows a, a huge interoperability of data between different systems. And the last one, uh, I think I will arrive in time, is, is, is Beacon. So Beacon is a, uh, also a GA4GH project. Um, we have uh, RD Connect and our colleague from CNG, which are champion of this technology also. And uh, and uh, beacons uh, uh, is is is, uh, is something which is at the heart uh, uh, um, targeting a federated discovery uh, of genomic data through different systems. So it's really oriented uh, around uh, discovering data, not so much uh, collecting this data and centralizing all of this data into, into a central place, but much more. Uh, emphasizing the discovery and the search of information into the different systems. So you see on D1, the scope was mainly for a scientist to see where in the world could we have uh, uh, some, someone or uh, an institute which have a C at chromosome 13 at the position blah blah blah. And then the answer was yes or no. So it's really a discovery process. The V2, which is planned for June, which is uh, promising a lot of interesting information, uh, proposed to query uh, on a broader scope, so with genomic variants, individual, both sample. The core space is arriving, which is very important also for, for our topic, and then uh, with the data access level. And the last thing is that uh, Beacon is uh, allowing uh, networking of, 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 of servers to query uh, across uh, multiple sites. Um, I, I finish with this uh, slide, uh, which is um, finally the, the problem statement that we have to, uh, to finish with this data format, and we have a few months uh, ahead in order to uh, arrive there. But um, uh, the first one is uh, we must define this consistent and sustainable uh, data strategy. And why do we do that? It's because we have multiple hospitals with multiple EHR technology with multiple data models. So we, the second reason is uh, uh, the, the, spec, the project is covering this large data spectrum, some for genomic and up to clinical formats, and we must uh, have a way to connect this uh, together in a standard way, this genomic and clinical data to develop a better AI model. Otherwise, the AI scientists will have no way to align their model on the same reference data models for increasing the quality. So, and also the fidelity learning is, is increasing a new level of complexity because each system must also share the same data model for uh, aligning with the same AI model. So, <clears throat> The problem is uh, not so much into the genomic space because the, 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 the standards are well known and with a clear scope and applicability. It's much more in the clinical space because we have different alternatives um, with GA4GH, Beacon, Phenopacket, Fire, and we have many overlapping between all of these standards. And it's uh, actually, actually the, the challenge of, of, the, of our work package five and eight to align this uh, strategy. And I finished, sorry, I'm one minute late, perhaps no time for questions, but... Uh, um. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent. I think you covered a very important topic and quite complicated, at least for me. There, uh, I, I can see that there is uh, you know, no time left for question. However, if uh, you can answer a couple of questions that was raised by Inyaki and others about Beacon. So one question, are we supposed to implement uh, or use Beacon standard in the Genome for All project? And do beacon replace or complement phenopackets? So are we? Uh, I would say yes and no for the moment because it's totally open. It's an open question, and the beacons provide, uh, as I said, uh, a very interesting capability for data discovery. And uh, and uh, we we may find use cases where this approach is very um, uh, very applicable. And the second reason uh, for for promoting beacon it's because it's a uh, it's in some way data format agnostic, so it's not enforcing any phenotype data formats in it. So it's a very lightweight data data models which can embed uh, other data models. So we could imagine having 
fire resources or phenopacket um, uh, phenopacket format embedded into beacons for the sake of um, um, of of of, of, a, of a disco data discovery. So I say yes and no, and we have to uh, to finalize the decision now in the following month. Um, another questions? Uh, oh yeah. Another question is from Alberto, that uh, is Fino packets and beacons are created from annotated BCF. Uh, is there a way or tools to go from annotation to these formats? Uh, no, not from what I know, there is no standard for doing that. It's, I think, a proprietary implementation from VCF file to create the Fino packet format or extract uh, into a, a file. We could also imagine that with fire. It's uh, always uh, the the one I'm aware of for fire. There is um, an open source called VCF to fire, which has been ported now in Python and it seems to be mature, which takes um, a VCF files and transform that into fire diagnostic report. Uh, so uh, that's the diagnostic report I've shown in the, in the first slide. So I'm, I'm aware of fire uh, for phenol packets. I am not aware of. I should ask the question to Jordi and Davide, who are the who are the the, the king of of the of the standard. If there is something which is standard, but I have not mm -hmm. seen anything yet personally. Well, for Beacon, I can answer that yes. Uh, VC, annotated VCF is the file that Beacon reads, and uh, in the Beacon GitHub code, it is provided that uh, the, there are tools provided to annotate your VCF file. So that will be one pipeline, and then you can put on top of it the Beacon. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we have the. Okay. Well, I see there is no further questions. Thank you, Vincent. Really uh, wonderful presentations today. I can see, and uh, I think we we covered a lot of topic today. I quite liked it that how much range we showed in this one and a half hour, and I look forward to to get feedback, to receive some feedbacks, and perhaps uh, more workshops like this. Vincent and Janice, do you have uh, comments? Uh, no, just thanks for giving me the chance to talk here. OK, thanks very much for this uh, closing um, speech, uh, Babita. Uh, that's perfect. And um, uh, we are, yes, as, as, as she said, we're open to any question which may help us uh, going further into this, uh, all of these exploratory sessions and uh, hope to, uh, to see other workshop coming, uh, coming up soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.